seemingly this, the four papers that we heard are not quite in line with each other, but however, I think, I think there's a message there. The message being that looking at the, uh, the newspaper that Ricky had prepared for us, they would discover that Hong Kong uh, uh, high density looks like this. And I think the message is very clear. It's not by choice, it's by necessity. I think the necessity meaning that, uh, first of all, it's the land uh, availability, and secondly, it's the affordability uh, of the land price and all that. I think what we need to show us is that Hong Kong has learned from the West in the 50s and 60s, and now they're coming back to learn from Hong Kong. Uh, the central of Hong Kong, you know, with the three levels, uh, being underground is one level, the ground level is one level, and then uh, in the central is all connected by uh, overpass, uh, pedestrian overpass, the third level, which is something that in the 50s, uh, Team 10 uh, had already talked about, uh, Smithson has already talked about, but it's happening, it's already happened in Hong Kong. So, so Hong Kong is a fast growing city, fast developed city, and there's no question High density has proven, you know, with its cultural background to be a, a model of success uh, in certain uh, respect, uh, aspect. And so, what next? We have heard Professor Tang talked about the in the inequality, the in social injustice, the, uh, the spatial injustice. So, I think what Winnie finally said is that, okay, it's up to us, right? Within, within the parameters we have, within the restrictions we have. So how do we move forward? One of the, uh, one of the um, uh, recent episodes that the post-80s, that is younger generation, are protest, uh, protesting. They're protesting, one of the things they protest is to protest against the, uh, the developers. Um, in a sense, the developers are um, riding on this high land price and, and then, and then building, building flats of, and offering flats for sale that is beyond any, any young person's uh, reach in terms of their salary and all that. Uh, even having worked in uh, 10 years after graduation, they can't still afford to buy a place. So I think these protests are beginning to, to um, brew. Not only the uh, social inequality and injustice that uh, Professor Tang talked about be between the rich and the, uh, the have and have nots, but even among the, uh, the so-called middle class, the affordability uh, is seemingly uh, becoming a very, very critical uh, boiling point. So I think the four papers that, uh, uh, that we heard this afternoon in session, uh, starting from Rainier, talked about how China is opening up, uh, turning into cities of uh, uh, more or less the same faces, right? To Elizabeth Burton talked about how quality matters, you know, is the, de is the design, is the uh, small things, the details that matters. Right, to the about to Professor Tang's uh, social injustice injustice space and to Winnie Mass is that it's up to us how to design it. So I think it's all connected, right, with in in that sense. And in fact it's connected with the last session where Anthony and uh, talked about uh, the way we are and, and the advantage and disadvantage. And in fact it talked about, like I said in the beginning, uh, connected with what Yok Chow and what we discussed early in the morning, the high density and health uh, being all connected. So the session here open up for discussion. Yeah. Right. Yes, with the whole. Um, I have been making this point uh, that uh, the kind of uh, injustice that was mentioned by Professor Tang uh, has much to do with the fact that uh, too little land has been developed in Hong Kong. The fact that there's too little land developed in Hong Kong means that rent has to be very high. Mm -hmm. And the fact that rent is very high means that a lot of uh, uh, industries or sectors cannot develop, you know, because uh, uh, they cannot afford the high rent. So uh, there is a, a lot of uh, potential entrepreneurs that can uh, make do with small businesses. They cannot survive, you know, bec because they cannot afford the rent. And so they have been eliminated. And so there's more and more concentration of wealth. Uh, and the land rich class becomes uh, extremely well off. And those people who do own nothing about of land, they become uh, marginalized. And uh, the fact that we cannot uh, diversify our industries has very much to do also with, with the fact that we have developed too little land. We have only 7% of our territory's land devoted to housing and about 4% uh, uh, of land uh, for industrial and commercial purposes. And it's really 
amazing. Yeah, it's something that we have to address. Thank you. Right. And we have heard from uh, Secretary Yorkshire this morning that 40% of our land is, is totally a uh, green area. Right. Right. Sophia? Yes, I would like uh, to, uh, to link the last presentation to Hong Kong because actually I have a puzzle here. We hear that uh, Hong Kong is a dense city and at the same time that it is a safe city. Uh, we hear that there is poverty in Hong Kong, that there are inequalities, that there are people who live in cubicles and so on. So you have to explain to us how, how does this happen? How well guarded the city is? Is it because of a very efficient police? We didn't see many police cars yesterday during the tour. CCTVs, uh, maybe there are uh, wonderful social control mechanisms that have not been developed here but I would li that I would like to hear about. Or is it the stability of the population? Or are there agreements, which is a very tense uh, issue at the moment, both in America and in Europe, between architects and the police, at, at least in France, uh, any new project needs to receive the agreement of the police uh, before architects or planners can go further. So could you tell us more about that? Can I would I, have a I lot to say, but I'm going to stop here. Can I ask Wing Xing to, to answer that? Uh, since you talked about uh, N but about Hong Kong, but I want to Hong know Kong. about Hong yeah, Kong. Yeah, why Hong Kong is more yeah, safe, so rel safe relative yeah. to other high density cities. Yeah. God, this question maybe Tony is better to answer. <laughs> I will take up uh, uh, Professor Ho's uh, thing. Uh, I, I, I don't want to get into a debate about Hong Kong because it's an urban age conference. It's uh, about everywhere in the world. Nevertheless, I think there's a rhetoric, there's a so-called rhetoric saying that all the problems are due to limited availability of land. And that's why in a sense the Secretary for uh, Development saying that you know you, we, we can develop another 1% and then we have all mm -hmm. the land available. The issue is not just land availability. The issue is, is the, uh, I have stressed so much about injustice. Let me quote you one example. You know, in one example, in one development, it was recorded in the news. The developer can make 50% profit out of one particular flat in the development. And I talked to the former planning director. I want to confirm that with, with him. He said, no, not 50%, 100%. It's that issue, not land availability per se. And the issue is, you know, they can make so much money. Who, who pay for that? Open up a land, making a land from a raw land to surface land. We have to, in the Chinese way, so talk, talking about we have to level it, we have to provide the transportation and all the things. Who provided? The government. The government, who, where did the government get the money? the taxpayers. That's one level I would call exploitation. Second level, why can a particular flat, a particular location can command so high a rent? Because other people live there, make the place a livable place, and thereby, you know, the, the particular developer can command higher rent. So it is in a sense a double. That's what I am arguing. It's not, it's not land availability. The government has used it to get out of the problem. Right, Sorry. okay, thank you. Uh, tomorrow, in, in case you don't know, uh, uh, Wing Sheng mentioned about uh, Carrie Lam, but Carrie is the uh, Secretary for Development. She's coming to give the keynote tomorrow morning so we can follow up with that question. But to answer Sophie's question very, very quickly before I, I, I pass on to Rainier and Anthony and then also the gentlemen over there. Probably in the 60s and 70s, there were all kinds of uh, uh, psychological studies and social studies on Hong Kong high density and overcrowding and why uh, the crime rate is low, and, and according to those texts in those days, it says because of uh, the, uh, the local culture, the Chinese culture, Confucianism, and all that. But I don't know if it's, it's still true 50 years later. All right, Renier. 
I don't really have an answer to your question other than the fact that I think your question is partly um, unanswerable. Uh, since I've been in the business of architecture, I have known studies that try to establish a relationship between crime and the built environment. To my knowledge, none of them have ever been conclusive. But I would like to point out another crime, which I think is where you're going. I think there is a clear relation between crime and real estate. There is a clear relation, and, and in a way to talk about petty crime uh, related to the built environment completely differs from the fact that real estate, property development, you know, our noble profession is deeply embedded in crime. We've had a parliamentary inquiry in the Netherlands, supposedly not a very corrupt uh, country, you know, a respectable parliamentary uh, democracy that exposed deep links uh, between crime to the fact that an entire nation is paying about 50% more for their homes than they should be paying. Um, we do work in Russia where the entire uh, expansion of Moscow is sued up with the construction companies well before even an announcement is made that the city will expand. And if there is a topic like density in crime uh, or, or architecture and crime or uh, the built environment and crime, I think that's the topic uh, to be addressed. Right. Okay. Anthony, you want to say words? Well, I just want to uh, uh, echo you know, the thing that when we talk about density and also the uh, crime and also social pathology, I think throughout the last half a century of uh, you know, research, I think it's not very conclusive, right? There are a lot of factors that are affecting it. And I think in the discussions today, I think we talk about the environment, and it seems that the environment is causing a lot of problems. But I think we have to think about it in the other way. Is actually, is it the social political uh, process uh, that is being exemplified or it will like be manifested in the environment? So the environment is actually one of the effects. For example, the poor are living in this poor environment is because they are poor rather than the, because of the poor environment that makes them poor or make them, you know, uh, exceptions like, like that, right? And so I think we have to really be very careful when we're talking about the, you know, relationships, right? Whether the, 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 the uh, inequality, is it basically it's a society issue, it's not the environment issue, but the environment is just a, the type of uh, manifestations of this whole uh, uh, issue itself, right? I think I would just like to end up uh, quoting, you know, one of the seminar I heard from uh, David Harvey. They say that there are two types of crimes. One is this type of uh, mafia, right? We all know what is the mafia. The other type of crime is the government. Thank you. All right. <laughs> thank you. All right. Uh, a question over there. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, very good uh, presentation. When I listen presentation related to density, I ask myself probably my presentation of tomorrow was related to density and overcrowding uh, should be here. Uh, when I listen Winnie Mark, he answer one of my questions because the question is uh, urban planning and design for high density. I found uh, in my paper I'm going to present tomorrow uh, not any association net between density and overcrowding. I found cities were highly dense, but not overcrowded based on the definition of overcrowding in the house. Cities were not dense, but were overcrowded related, therefore, to urban planning and housing. Uh, relationship between overcrowding and housing also, I found that uh, there is not direct relationship between overcrowding and health because you have to take into consideration the living condition related to basic services, water, sanitation, and so on. Therefore, I'm very glad and I hope that uh, Winnie Mars will help us tomorrow to answer some of the questions related to urban planning and design. Thank you. Uh, there's a question over there before I invite you, Ricky. Yes, please. Yeah, just a quick short observation because on page 20 and 21 of this uh, Urban Age, uh, this newspaper, this booklet that I look up, and if you just see the densities are mentioned in third column and crime rate, murder rate on the next page, and actually the correlation is the reverse of what we have been talking about. Every high density city seems to have low murder rates and low crime rates, and that is actually true for most because I know more Indian cities very well, Mumbai is safer than Delhi and Mumbai density is higher than Delhi. 
So it is, I think we need to look into this aspect a little more deeper than just establishing this, uh, exactly what my, the previous speaker pointed out. Good, thank you. Of course, sorry, on that, we don't have the correlation with drugs and alcohol, which could explain yeah. a lot more. Yeah. Ricky, you have a question. I, I had, uh, I mean, hearing Libby Burton and um, Vinnie Mass, you might think that we were listening to presentations which, uh, not to mention Rainier, uh, <laughs> which didn't have to do with the same profession. Not, it sounded as if you weren't involved in crafting of space. Huh? But I think in a way you were capturing something which is sort of a, a description of space as you know it or observe it, which is a sort of vernacular. So Libby in, let's say, in a very Anglo-Saxon way, and that's not a criticism, <laughs> um, you were sort of searching in your looking for streets with front doors, let's say, with something which people feel comfortable with and therefore give a sense of health and safety, et cetera, which is interesting. Um, Rainier showed us um, a world which is distant, but some people find comfortable. The Dubai image is, is, has become a vernacular. Uh, and um, it's interesting that you stop short, maybe because of time, Rainier, to show how your practice, OMA, might actually intervene there in such a way that it goes against the vernacular. And Vinny, you, you, you provoked, as you always do, by, in a way, acknowledging that the typology that is prevalent here, but uh, in Asia and in places with all, all the images of things that we've been talking about, as being uh, sort of you know, the, 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 the background vernacular of tall buildings, and you've invented a new one. Yeah. Are there any common themes about the nature of the relationship between the living unit and public space? I mean, you, it's interesting that you take that tower block and you made 55 or 500 Lego models, right? And they're sort of twisted things, you know, which, which seem to have, but I don't know, I couldn't tell, some level of public space but verticalized. Is, is that what you're doing? Is it, is it somehow trying to reinvent density in such a way that it's more humane, let's say in, in Libby's much more conventional terms, or, or is it just playing with space? I think that's important to us. I mean, I, 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 you know what I'm saying. <laughs> I think you're completely correct that uh, in, uh, somehow I was also surprised by uh, your presentation and to see the connection um, um, with our work and try to three-dimensionalize um, um, it. So maybe um, this afternoon session has given you, uh, as uh, organizers, uh, in maybe not a complete and deep overview of the relationship between, uh, say, the social figure in density uh, and uh, the issues of, of, of safety that surrounds that uh, subject. But it has uh, um, given you that sequence from XL to XS in different words. I think you, that I, I found this four actually more consistent than I, would, than I expected them to be uh, on beforehand, and that's what you're pointing <coughs> at. You use an intriguing uh, word for it, vernacular. As, as a definition for um, to cover, say, the distance between uh, a human being and the outside space, or to make it more inhabitable, is that? And I think it's it's interesting that you want to um, go beyond, say, the yeah, for architects normally horrible, uh, say, word the word vernacular always kills um, experimentation, kills innovation, and is connected to what we already know, and is therefore more based on fear than it's more based on progress. So. Is it true that you use that word on purpose to span the gap from, say, an Anglo-Saxon definition and of, uh, uh, of inhabiting uh, density with a certain kind of um, uh, and, uh, socialness up to the massiveness that is needed in order to beat the densities? Uh, I don't think this should be a comp uh, just a backwards form. It just, no, I just, I'm trying to observe that what you're doing as architects is actually, um, in a way, developing a language which takes what is there but taking it forward. So absolutely, uh, I see that as a progress. I think it's sometimes difficult to understand what it is you're doing, and it doesn't seem willful. I think that, that, that would be my point, which... Okay, to, just to end with two sentences, the, the Lego exercise is not finished yet. It's just under production. It is... Um, it, it, it will never be, <laughs> and it, uh, the aim is indeed 10,000 towers, uh, which describe 
um, uh, how social space and vertical senses could be made economically and uh, technically. Thank Good, thank you. In order time for the uh, uh, the final evening keynote, I would like to take more two more questions, and that will be it. Uh, there is one. And one. Uh, and one. And one. And one. Okay. Uh, let me let me start with this one side first. Uh, Professor Young, and then and then uh, Becky Kwok, and then Edgar. Can we can we? Yeah. yeah, we have to stop. All right. Otherwise, we go on forever. All right. All right. So, Professor Young, please. I am Yu Man Young. I'm from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, what I had heard, well, I came late this morning because I had another meeting in another place uh, in the morning. Now, what I have heard uh, since uh, has been very fascinating to me because. I've been sort of reliving my earlier debate uh, on the high-rise, high-density living uh, in the 1970s. I actually present, well, by the way, I spent uh, 11 years of my professional life in Singapore, during which time we had a lot of debate about high-rise, high-density living in Singapore and also in relation to Hong Kong. Uh, what I just want to contribute to this uh, forum is that uh, I presented a paper on that subject, high-rise, high-density living, myths and realities, at the UN Habitat uh, Conference in Vancouver in 1976. And uh, the paper was published in the inaugural uh, issue of uh, Urban Habitat. So if you are interested to relieve some of the arguments that we have uh, been uh, going back and forth. I think this is the place to go back on. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Becky? Uh, Jackie. Jackie. Uh, sorry, I, I am afraid I have to uh, uh, disagree with uh, Professor Anthony Yan uh, again. Uh, mm. uh, when he talks about uh, that, uh, the, I mean the issue of uh, poverty is a social issue, but not an issue of environment. When we think about uh, gentrification, uh, we take, an uh, for example, uh, the district of Wan Chai. Uh, before gentrification, before the, I mean, uh, the older building were demolished, uh, the, the, the rate, uh, the, uh, I mean, the, the uh, rate uh, to pay uh, is uh, about uh, 2,000 to 3,000 Hong Kong dollar per square foot. But after gentrification, how much have to, we have to pay for, for a flat in, in, in one child? It's uh, more than 10,000 to uh, 15,000 uh, dollars per square foot. So where uh, did all the poorer people go? They go to Jin Shui Wai, just like what uh, Professor uh, Tang has said. So uh, what I think is uh, uh, poverty is an urban politics, not only a, a, a social issue. And I always think that uh, social issues should always uh, be uh, included uh, in the discussion uh, in uh, urban politics. And it shows uh, uh, environment, uh, for environment, uh, it always reveals some kind of uh, injustice uh, in, in the, uh, I mean, urban development. Okay, thank you. <laughs>